we can get into a cyber war if you want, but you're not going to come out well and we have more capabilities than you do. We'll all be damaged, but you'll be damaged worse. That interview is coming up in just a little bit. You're listening to Asia News Weekly, a digest from the Asia Pacific region. Asian businesses are heating up the markets, Japan pumps up regional diplomacy, and China once more hacks the United States. These stories and more are on the September 26th edition of Asia News Weekly. Welcome everyone to the show. I'm your host, Steve Miller, and I want to thank you so much for listening and downloading this week's podcast. Last week, it was announced that the Chinese government successfully once more hacked into a U.S. computer system. And it wasn't just any U.S. computer system. It was that of the U.S. Transportation Command, or TRANSCOM. Now, these hackers just didn't manage to penetrate the system one time. They did so 20 times over the course of a single year. The Chinese military has a long history of hacking into not only civilian systems, but U.S. government systems. And this process resulted in the indictment of five individuals in May of this year. It's a no-brainer that the United States needs to have a strong cyber defense. But one of the questions I have is whether or not the business sector, and to an extension, the government, Will they be content in deploying only electronic countermeasures? Or does a more aggressive response need to take place? To answer this question, I phoned up Scott Harold, an associate political scientist at the Rand Corporation. Generally speaking, cyber has to be broken into two or three big chunks. One is what the U.S. government would define as legitimate cyber, which is targeting foreign government military and intelligence targets, and foreign governments will target the U.S. military and intelligence systems, and that's uh, the U.S. view is kind of, that's fair play, everybody spies, we know that this happens, we do it, we will never admit to it, but we know that this is the rules of the game. Second part is cyber, again, civilian, quote-unquote civilian or commercial targets, so here you'd be looking at things like alleged Chinese military or Russian military hacking of U.S. private sector firms or other private sector organizations or even non-private NGO type organizations. And that's, I think, the the real concern there is that kind of hacking is intended to kind of kneecap the American private sector. Scott said that no private sector government could compete with the resources of a government. Well, Uh, at least not a government of the size of Russia or China. And then the third part of cyber is not really about uh, stealing information, but actually engaging in what is sometimes referred to as cyber war or trying to actively crash foreign systems or foreigners trying to actively crash U.S. systems that are responsible for critical infrastructure or military command and control and operations. That kind of information is extremely valuable in trying to understand the complex nature of cyber warfare. So what needs to be done? The appropriate response, and I think the U.S. government's response to uh, the first one, is, well, we've got, you know, we've got a job to do. We have to make sure that we strengthen our U.S. government-owned systems as well as the systems of contractors and support infrastructure, and there's a role for the private sector to play in that. Scott mentioned it was important for the government and these private sector entities to discuss legislation, to discuss policies, and clarify responsibilities related to security. The second part of it is kind of, you know, what what do you do in terms of trying to convince the Chinese, the Russians, or others who might uh, have advanced capabilities not to actually target those capabilities against private corporations? You know, try to try to convince China not to attack Cisco or not to try to break into Google, something like that. That's that's a really very difficult nut to crack. I think there is some discussion of a lot of different tools. One discussion of uh, trying to have a conversation with China about rules of the road and establishing certain norms in cyberspace and also establishing what each of us has as an understanding of various kinds of definitions. So, for example, 
if you're China and I'm the United States, you might think X kind of behavior is acceptable. I might view that as crossing a red line. Whereas on the other hand, I might think, oh, I can do A, B, C, and D. And those are, you know, China won't like those, but, you know, they're not going to view those as war activities or as militarized activities. And then the hardest edge of, of all of the response is the attempt to dissuade or deter foreign governments, foreign actors from undertaking activities through the promise of painful retaliation. In other words, uh, deterrence through threats. We can get into a cyber war if you want, but you're not going to come out well and we have more capabilities than you do. We'll all be damaged, but you'll be damaged worse. And that's, I think, definitely not where the U.S. government would like to have us all end up. But I think there is a substantial risk that we may be trending in that direction simply because arms control and arms limitation, if translated into the cyber domain, is very, very difficult to do. In an environment where it's generally very difficult to do attribution, uh, how do I convince you, Steve, not to hack me, Scott, when you can pose as Jamie, Bob, Teresa, Shannon, any one of a million other people, and I won't know for sure that you did it, or maybe I probably won't know that you did it, and, and my response could easily be the response of someone else masquerading as me. Scott Harold is an associate political scientist at the Rand Corporation. Now, you've heard Scott's recommendations, Scott's ideas, but now I'd like to hear from you. How do you feel the United States should respond to China's hacking attempts? Please leave a comment or tweet your answer to me. Later on in the program, Japan puts on the regional diplomacy offensive. When it comes to Asian business news, no other story has captivated the headlines this past week. And of course, I'm speaking about the IPO of Chinese tech giant Alibaba. Why has it captivated so much attention? Well, for one reason. Alibaba boasts a 30% annual growth rate. When it dropped on the New York Stock Exchange, it debuted at $68. It quickly shot up to almost $100. And even though interest has waned in this past week, the stock still is riding high at just over $90 per share. Matt Turlip, an analyst with Privco, did his own valuation and believes the shares are worth about $100 each at this point. Quote, it's a giant, profitable company right now, that's growing like a startup still." End quote. Jack Ma, the man behind the Chinese e-commerce company, started out as an English teacher and founded the company in 1999 and is said to be worth somewhere in the neighborhood of $14 billion. One of the reasons this IPO is being watched so closely is that Yahoo, the once dominant internet portal, has nearly a 24% stake in the company. Technology analysts believe the cash infusion could breathe new life into Yahoo. And some have even talked about a rebranding, while others have mentioned a buyout. The question still remains. In Japan, the IPO could also have a huge impact, as mobile carrier SoftBank has a more than 30% stake in Alibaba. Some speculate CEO Masayoshi Son may use the funding to bid on Europe's Vodafone. But that wasn't the only big business news this week. A Chinese court has fined British drug giant GlaxoSmithKline $490 million and sentenced Mark Riley, its former country manager, and other executives to prison for bribing doctors and hospitals to use its products. It's the single largest penalty ever handed out by a Chinese court. And speaking of payouts, if you hold Sony stock, you won't be getting any. For the first time since 1958, Sony will not pay any stockholders dividends. CEO Kazuo Hirai said Sony's management team is taking this very seriously. Analysts point to the tech giant's inability to capitalize on smartphone sales and are projecting a 230 billion yen shortfall this year, an estimate that was only 50 billion yen two months ago. Sony is slashing its workforce by an additional 15% or 1,000 employees, this after selling off its PC division and spinning off the TV unit, and also cutting 5,000 jobs this year. On the South Korean front, President Park Geun-hye has inked a free trade agreement with Canada. Prime Minister Stephen Harper called the Korean leader's visit historic earlier this week. 
The Harper government has said the free trade deal finalized after a decade on-again and off-again negotiation would increase Canadian exports to South Korea by 32 percent and grow the economy by 1.7 billion Canadian dollars. And speaking of South Korea, let me bring back technology correspondent for the Korea Times, Kim Yoo Chol. Yeah, hi. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm doing great. I have a question for you. This past week, some of the biggest technology news has been about the release of Apple's new iPhone 6 and 6 Plus. And admittedly, the iPhone 6 is outselling the 6 Plus, the new phablet from Apple. But it's not the only large phone out on the market. Samsung has its Galaxy Note line. And I wanted to ask you, what is the buzz? What is the pulse on the street about the new Galaxy Note 4? I think Samsung has a strong pride as a creator in the Pebble market because Samsung was the first to release a large size smartphone. I mean, size over five inches in 2011. As you know, a new order is prevailing in the global smartphone market. And that means pricing is really driving form factor for consumers to decide to purchase their smartphone, not specifications, not design features, because a lot of smartphone manufacturers in the market right now. So Apple is losing its momentum in terms of profit. So they have no option but to change their strategies. The strategy you troll is speaking about that's releasing two phones a year. No longer is Apple, in his mind, going to release a single device a year in terms of a phone. They're going to follow what other manufacturers have done and release multiple handsets. It's a way to improve their bottom line. And as more people use tablets, it allows customers to consume digital media on larger screens. But back to the question at hand, what about that Galaxy Note 4? The attention is stripped for the Samsung Galaxy Note 4 because Samsung is losing also its momentum and its profits in the mobile business division, which is a big cash generator inside the Samsung group. It's being challenged by the rise of Chinese fellow rivals and the consumer shift towards budget phones. In South Korea, Samsung will officially launch the Galaxy Note 4 to the local media. Mm, Samsung's marketing chief, Yi Dong Ju, he will answer questions from reporters and uh, the company will update its business strategy, business strategies around the Galaxy Note 4. And I think the competition will be getting fiercer between Apple and Samsung and also manufacturers in China because the market is, they believe the large size smartphone could be a good option to offset concerns of their margin profitability. So that is good for consumers because that means our consumers will get more you know, technology uh, improved and large size mobile phones with good price. Okay, well, let's talk about things that are good for consumers and things that are in the technology development arena. Samsung is largely viewed as the best example of how to implement an Android OS device. We see it on tablets, we see it on phones, we see it on the large Note phablets. But they're also continuously trying to release devices with their own operating system, Tizen. And there's another report that they're trying to do this a third time. What do you think they're trying to do by releasing a device with a th basically a third operating system out there? Yes, uh, this is a good question. As you mentioned, Samsung is heavily relied on Google's Android system, and the Samsung want to cut its reliance on Google because diversification has emerged a keyword that will enable Samsung to hatch its risk. So Samsung is generally you know, focusing on Tizen because Tizen is a new open based system with a collaboration with uh, United States chip maker Intel. Samsung has experienced a few setbacks in launching its Tizen devices because of lack of customized applications and developer content. So currently, Samsung's overseas mobile clients have to delay the release of Tizen powered smartphone because of those two reasons. But Samsung is pushing more because now the 
Tizen main Tizen topics include open source project leadership and Tizen TV architecture and developing applications with Tizen web APIs. For multiple profiles. Now, what multiple profiles could he be speaking about? Well, we're getting in the realm of that internet connected house, your washing machine, your refrigerator, all your home appliances running on a single operating system that you can control from your smartphone. And one of the things that Samsung wishes to do is to have that Tizen powered smartphone to control your home, to create its own ecosystem. But what about the future? Samsung's Tizen efforts, I can say Tizen efforts will pay off, I think according to Samsung officials, my Samsung context, uh, in the area of wearables, as wearable device market has huge growth potential. That means Samsung wants to get reference uh, before heavily pushing the Tizen. And Samsung applied the Tizen platform to wearable devices. Think about the Galaxy Gear 2, a latest wearable device um, introduced by Samsung in the IFA Electronics Fair in Berlin uh, two weeks ago. Samsung put Tizen platform on the Gear 2. I think uh, Samsung will put a Tizen platform to another like a wearable device which is in work. And also a senior Samsung executive, uh, Kim Hyun Hyun Seok, uh, who is leading the Samsung television business recently told reporters that Samsung, which is the world's biggest the TV manufacturer, will release Tizen powered television models next year's consumer electronics fair in Las Vegas. So let's see what happens. Yeah, it will be worth checking out to see how this all plays out. Kim Uchul is a technology reporter for the Korea Times. Thank you so much for joining me today. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. I think the Samsung development is quite interesting. How do you feel about a third-party operating system running your phone, your wearable device, and your home appliances? Would you feel comfortable going with something as unknown as Tizen, or would you feel more secure with an iOS or Android system? Personally, I think venturing off in this direction and trying to compete directly with Apple and Google is a mistake. But given Samsung's huge appliance market share, it could really pay off. If you'd like to know more about this or any of the stories mentioned in the podcast this week, please take a look at the show notes over at asiannewsweekly.net. There's no denying Japan is a major player in the world, but the nation continues to get the cold shoulder from South Korea and China. Natsuo Yamaguchi, head of the Kamado Party, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's coalition partner in the government said, On the diplomatic front, particularly toward improving relations with neighboring countries China and South Korea, I would like to push strongly for the realization of summits with Chinese and South Korean leaders. As a ruling party, we are determined to supplement government efforts and strive using every channel. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is also pushing for a meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping at the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Meeting in Beijing this coming November. So far, the Chinese government hasn't given the go-ahead for that face-to-face. -face. Former Japanese Prime Minister Yoshiro Mori actually put in the ask for Abe once more to South Korea's President Park Geun-hye before she left for her North American trip, saying the Japanese leader eagerly wanted to meet. As there are matters to address, I hope that we can hold dialogue and work to improve relations so that next year becomes a good year for both South Korea and Japan, Abe wrote in his letter. Pak continues to refuse to meet with Abe, believing he and the Japanese leadership continues to glorify the nation's militaristic past. In fact, she's only met with Abe once during her presidency, and that was a meeting arranged by Barack Obama. Pak has called for a courageous decision by Tokyo to improve ties between its Asian neighbors. There first needs to be sincere efforts to heal the wounds of the past, Pak told Mori when he delivered the letter. There are only 55 former comfort women who are still alive, and I'm looking to you, speaking of Mori, to help restore their dignity while they are still with us, so that relations between South Korea and Japan can improve. Another of Abe's regional initiatives also hasn't panned out as planned. Earlier this week, North Korea submitted its initial report on Japanese abductees. I've long said not to expect too much and that North Korea is most likely using the dialogue to obtain concessions from Japan, 
North Korea said the report on abductees would include only information on missing persons not on Japan's official list. And this amounts to a total of 17 individuals. The report will focus on those individuals suspected of being in North Korea, but not officially designated as abductees, like those left in North Korea following the end of World War II, and in those Japanese spouses of North Koreans who returned to their native country. The Japanese government is calling the approach half-baked, and believes these small increments are being used to try and elicit as many economic benefits as possible from Japan. And you know what? It's about time. This approach was pretty much evident from the onset. Japan's National Police Agency believes that there are more than 800 missing people, many of whom may have been abducted. Quote, The Japanese side has conveyed firmly to North Korea that there must be a speedy, comprehensive, and overall investigation concerning all Japanese citizens beginning with the abductees, said Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshihide Suga. Turning to New York, Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will petition the United Nations for a permanent seat on the Security Council. Now, all five members of the Security Council need to agree to that change, as would two-thirds of the General Assembly. The addition would give Japan the veto power, something China wouldn't necessarily want. India, Brazil, and Germany are also trying to get a permanent seat on the Council. And in another interesting bit of news this week, Hideki Kaneda, a former fleet commander of Japan's Maritime Self-Defense Force, postulated Taiwan should be included in the Japan-U.S. Mutual Cooperation and Security Treaty, and that Taiwan and Japan should establish a, quote, quasi-alliance. It's not a new idea, and one proposed several years ago by Taiwan's DPP under Chen Shui-ban between 2000 and 2008. That thought was also echoed by a former DPP chair, and one item the party does plan to consider if it wins the 2016 election. While proposing the idea of a quasi-alliance between Taiwan and Japan, Kaneda might have ignored the state of cross-strait relations, and not to mention that China has emerged as a global power. In just a moment, the Weekly Brief, a collection of stories to help you stay better informed about the region. The ever-changing nature of politics continues in the Asia-Pacific region, and here are a few major updates from the week. On Monday, thousands of students in Hong Kong began a week-long boycott of classes in protest over Beijing's proposed election plan. The students are calling for electoral reform as part of the larger Occupy Central movement and ahead of a massive October 1 protest. Quote, we demand the government to respond to our call to endorse civil nominations, said Alex Chow, chairman of the Hong Kong Federation of Students. Chow continues, If we hear nothing from them, the students, the people will definitely upgrade the movement to another level. A few minor scuffles did take place with authorities during the student-led protest. Hong Kong residents are calling for true universal suffrage and not the cherry-picking of candidates proposed by the mainland. Under the current conditions, about 20% of Hong Kong residents are contemplating emigration. The last such massive exodus from Hong Kong occurred just before the handoff, and many who are leaving don't feel the one-nation, two-system approach is viable. United States President Barack Obama decided not to impose sanctions against Thailand over its failure to combat human trafficking. Thailand said it would endeavor to make strides as its status was listed as Tier 3. Some of the junta's leaders have feared sanctions would be levied, but the foreign ministry praised Obama's decision, which it said reflected that Washington has considered Thailand's efforts in recent months. It's expected the current government will endorse and enforce laws related to human rights protection to improve its ranking. A Malaysian law student has been sentenced to one year in prison after being found guilty of sedition in Kuala Lumpur. Pro-democracy activists condemned the decision, saying the government used a colonial-era law to stifle freedom of expression. Adam Adli Abdul Halim allegedly made seditious public statements leading up to and following Malaysia's general election last year. These included telling people to, quote, go down to the streets to seize back our power. Maria Chin Abdullah, chairperson of the Malaysian pro-democracy group Bursi, said Adam Adli's conviction shows how the Sedition Act allows the government to criminalize any speech they find offensive. Seventeen Malaysians, including opposition politicians, activists, and academics, 
are currently facing charges under the 1948 Sedition Act, and six others are being investigated. Even journalist Susan Loon wasn't immune and was interrogated under the act. In China, Uyghur scholar Ilham Todi was found guilty of separatism charges and sentenced to life in prison. Todi was an economics professor and critical of China's treatment of Uyghurs in the Xinjiang region. The Xinhua News Agency says the court ruled Todi spread lessons containing separatist thoughts and bewitched and coerced young ethnic students as part of his efforts to build a criminal syndicate. Todi was also found guilty of inciting ethnic hatred by distorting the causes of the Xinjiang unrest and colluded with foreign groups and individuals in hyping incidents related to Xinjiang with the aim of making domestic issues international. Todi, of course, denies all these charges. William Ni, nee, a Hong Kong-based researcher with Amnesty International, said there was no evidence Todi was ever involved in separatism. Indonesian President-elect Joko Widodo is whittling down 1,000 prospective cabinet members to a list of about 200. He will continue to reduce the number and feels confident he'll have the cabinet structure in place well ahead of his October 20th inauguration, with the final announcement of his cabinet within a week of taking office. Widodo aims to follow the spirit of the three powers, referring to political sovereignty, economic independence, and national character. And finally, Cambodia's International Tribunal has announced the second trial phase for two former Khmer Rouge leaders. This trial will begin on October 17th. It's the final trial phase for Nguyen Chi and Kyo Sampan. Their trials were split into two different phases for expediency. Both were previously found guilty in the first trial phase. This trial phase will focus on various crimes, including forced marriage and the alleged genocide of Cham Muslims and ethnic Vietnamese. Throughout many of these individual stories, there's been a common thread, the notion of free speech or freedom of expression, and it's come up in a number of different places, most notably in China and Malaysia. So I want to ask you, how do you feel the region addresses this particular issue? Are the governments clamping down too much on opposing views? Also, what do you think will happen in Hong Kong? And finally, can Abe finally get that meeting with Xi and Pak? If you like this podcast, don't miss our others, The Asia Brief and Asia Now. The Asia Brief is released every Monday through Thursday morning and gives you a glimpse into the region's top stories. Asia Now is released every Wednesday and features stories and interviews from the Asia-Pacific region. This week on Asia Now, who has the better claim on the contested islands in the East China Sea? Suhit Satartham breaks that down for us. And next week, we turn our attention back to the Asian Games. Were they successful, or are they just a thing of the past? Kicking things off in this week's brief is an update on the story from a few weeks ago. If you recall, a Chinese man fell three floors and severely injured his head. It actually resulted in a portion of his skull being removed, and he suffered from vision and language impairment. It was reported that the hospital was using a 3D printer to recreate the missing portion of his head. Now, during a three and a half hour operation on August 28th, doctors first separated his scalp peeled off some of the muscle, and then they inserted a new titanium mesh, which only weighs 9.9 .9 grams, and it was used to replace that damaged part of his skull. With the surgery complete, physicians are now working with this man to improve his vision and language abilities. For the amazing before and after photographs, please check out the link in the show notes. One of the major accomplishments from Chinese President Xi Jinping's South Asia tour might just be resolving a long-standing border issue with India. After a marathon meeting with Prime Minister Modi, she said, China has the determination to work with India through friendly consultation to settle the boundary question at an early date. We also have the sincerity to work with India to maintain peace and tranquility in the border areas before we are finally able to settle the boundary question. And speaking of China, the Global Times tabloid reports China and Iran are preparing to conduct joint military drills. Warships from the People's Liberation Army have docked at the Iranian port of Bandar. 
The exercises are aimed at establishing peace, stability, tranquility, and multilateral and mutual cooperation between the two countries, said Admiral Amir Hossein Assad, commander of Iran's first naval zone. The tabloid also states the navies will allow each nation to expect the other's naval vessels, and that both countries will participate in a cultural exchange, friendly games of soccer, table tennis, and tug-of-war. Human Rights Watch recently issued a report citing dozens of cases in which ordinary Vietnamese have been tortured, injured, or killed in police custody. The report stated deaths occurred when police were conducting interrogations, applying torture to illicit confessions. Human Rights Watch Asia Deputy Director Phil Robertson says, This is the report that was based on state-sanctioned news media sources. This is not something that the government of Vietnam can deny. And the fact that the problem is so systematic and pervasive indicates that Vietnam government has been doing very little to tackle the issue. What we've found proves their commitment is weak or non-existent. Vietnam responded with an official statement posted on the Foreign Ministry website, stating the nation has a firm commitment against all forms of torture or cruel treatments, and those who engage in abuse will be strictly punished in accordance to the law. And finally, last week, the International Whaling Commission voted to uphold a ban on Japan's whaling operation in the Antarctic Ocean. Conservationists applauded the ruling, but Japan said it would appeal the decision next year. Japan has conducted, quote, scientific whale hunts since 1986. Japan also reports it submitted its findings in peer-reviewed scientific journals more than 600 times. However, the International Court of Justice found only two such articles. Japan says that whaling is part of its culture and integral to some traditional food. Given that so few people eat whale, perhaps it's time to put that tradition to bed. Well, those are all the stories for this week's episode, and unfortunately, I don't have too many specific comments from last week's podcast to share with you, but I will say that a lot of messages did trickle in, and many people said that they enjoyed the format from last week's show, and especially the mix of stories. Again, that feedback is priceless to me, so I really do appreciate the time it took to write those email messages. Really, if you know of something that you like in the show or that you don't, please let me know. I want to make this podcast the best it can be to meet your needs. I do have one comment to share, and that was from our expat holiday show on Asia Now. A lot of people commented that simply being with their new family was all that mattered. Jim Mullen said, as long as I'm with Tomoko, his wife, that's all I needed. And that's really true. While it's nice to be with the family that you grew up with during the holidays, being able to spend the holidays with your immediate family, your new family, is equally important. Well, I'd love to hear from you. So please, if you have a comment about any of the stories I mentioned this week, please write your comment on our page, send it through Facebook, send it through Twitter. I want to hear from you. You can, of course, connect with us on Facebook. That address is facebook.com slash asianewsweekly or on Twitter. The address, yep, you guessed it, at Asia News Weekly. If you'd like to send us a voicemail message, you can also do that. Just fire up your Skype and dial up Asia News Weekly. When you leave your voicemail message, be sure to include your name and where you're calling from. You can also, of course, send that email to us, the address asianewsweekly at gmail.com. And if you don't have Skype, you can also attach your voice message to your email. You can, of course, play and download all of our episodes on websites like the Korea Times, Japan Today, Asia Pundits, and, of course, AsianNewsWeekly.net. But if you'd like the show in podcast form, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and, of course, TuneIn Radio. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends and subscribe so you won't miss the next one. Again, thank you so much for listening. Thank you for your feedback. I really do appreciate it. Until next time, for Asian News Weekly, I'm Steve Miller. Asian News Weekly is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License.